You are entering a world paved with good intentions. We are going to need a bigger boat. Welcome to another episode of Pave with Good Intentions, the show that asks the difficult questions you didn't even think you cared about. I'm Danielle Kessner, your podcaster about town, and this podcast is pretty sponsor-free, so thank you for supporting independent artists. And as you can tell, I am in my new digs. Obviously, this podcast is coming a little bit later than I promised, and that's because it's been kind of a crazy little bit of time here ever since I moved into my new house. And yes, it is mine. Um... And because of that, I'm going to dedicate an entire episode to just how awesome the process is for moving. And if you can't tell that I'm being sarcastic, well, um, that's not really my problem. But yeah, the process for buying your own home, especially for a first-time home buyer, is unbelievable. So we're going to be talking about that today. Um, but first, before we even get into that, here's a piece of random trivia. Did you know that ducklings can leave the nest only after a few hours, only a few hours after hatching? That's because they're covered in down, and they're so precocious. But that's a risk, though, because they will identify themselves with the first thing they see. It's called animal imprinting, and it's actually fairly controversial, but it's what animals will do. So it could look like a duck, it could quack like a duck, but it might think it's a giraffe. And did you know that a group of ducks can be called a raft? Fortunately, they don't have speech impediments, though. So, Now, on to our episode. Home again for the first time. So, I'm in my new home. You can see. I would love to take you on a little bit of a tour, so we might have time for that in this episode. But, in order to get here, the process is not exactly something that you could call easy. It's, uh... <laughs> buying a home is not unlike anything else I've ever purchased in my life, or unlike anything else I've ever done in my life, in terms of just the amount of paperwork and the amount of checks and all this in different stuff that it has to go through in order to obtain it. And you would imagine that, yes, you would have to go through quite a bit. It's not as simple as just handing over money and saying, here you go, take my money, give me your keys, kind of thing. You know, you could do the same. I mean, whenever I've, I've been a renter for eight years, so through all those eight years, anytime I, you know, went to a new place, I went in, filled out the application, gave them, you know, certain forms of ID, and I could be moving in within a week. I mean, it wasn't like it was this grand scheme of things, but then again, I wasn't buying something. I was leasing. I was just renting. But you can go in, you can give them all the information they need, give them a check, and they give you the keys, and you're basically renting for however long period of time. Same thing, it's like buying a car. You know, you go in, you pick the car you want, you could drive that car off the lot that day. All you have to do is show the paperwork, get the loan, do all that stuff. You know, it's 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 all something that you can do in an afternoon. I mean, those are simple purchases or simple agreements that you have out there. You know, it's like basically no different than going to the store and buying, you know, a head of lettuce and some Cheerios. Not sure what you're making there, but it's you go get what you want, you pay the money, and it's yours. I mean, that's pretty much all there is to it. Buying a home is a completely different ballgame altogether. And I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who have bought a home. So, you know, to this, this is just, you know, you can empathize with with me on this one because you've been through that song and dance and maybe some of you have even been through it multiple times you bought a home one place or you upgraded to a bigger one or you moved to a different city buying a home is not something that maybe it might happen more than one time in your lifetime and every single time you're going to get a different experience and it's going to be more challenging so just to kind of give you an idea like just to set this story up a little bit in Denver right now, Denver is one of the worst housing markets in the United States currently, which is remarkable considering the fact that we are not in California. Last time I checked, Denver is not in California. And California has four of the top five worst housing markets in the United States. San Francisco, Los Angeles, San Diego, San Jose. You take those four major cities and those are four of the most worst housing markets. And when I say worst, I mean basically the supply and demand 
is totally on the demand side. So people are, you know, they want to buy, 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 and there's not a lot of property to sell. So you've got many people going after the same properties at the same time, which means the sellers who might be kind of lowballing it or if they're trying to get things quickly, they'll lowball it a little bit. They can ask for pretty much whatever they want. And in Denver, that's kind of the situation that's going on right now. Um, pretty much the entire month of July, with some in June, but for basically an entire month, maybe a little bit more, I was, you know, I had a broker who was, you know, helping me find properties, going to look at them, and my first suggestion to anybody who's considering buying a house, do that. Get a broker. Do not just go onto Craigslist. Don't go to, you know, Z what is that? Zillow? Don't go to any of those websites because the information there, A, might not be up to date, and B, you might not be getting what you think you'd be getting. So you need somebody who's experienced. And the broker that I found who was recommended to me from a friend was phenomenal. Probably because, and this is one advantage in this case, is that he is a lawyer. So having a lawyer on your side, especially when you're talking about legal documents, isn't a bad thing. So Basically, for a month, I'm looking for a house, and you know, I'm looking at places that are within my price range. Obviously, I'm buying by myself, so you know, I don't make exorbitant amounts of money. I know by this awesome, you know, display of Quentin Tarantino posters that you think that I am just rolling in money, but that's not the case. Um, so, buying on my own kind of poses its own challenge. So, I kind of only had a limit of what I could actually spend or what I could offer. Um, and there's obviously a difference between if it were a single family or if it were a townhome. I landed in a townhome, and I'll get into that. But basically, you so you look at what you can afford, and you start to kind of go to those places. And at first, you know, I had you know the idea of what I was looking for at the time, or at least what I kind of wanted. And even some good good opportunities weren't really something that I was ready to make an offer on. So, and you look back on that and say, well, I probably should have. Lesson number two here is don't go into it with the expectation that you're going to A, find the right thing right away, or B, that if you do find something you like, that you have to make an offer on it. Because unless you're in a housing market that's as crazy as Denver right now, there's a chance that, you know, whatever you find, you could, you know, potentially see something more. But there's nothing wrong with making an offer your first day out. Um, but there's also some risk to that as well. And so, you know, I was looking at places, I was looking at condos, townhomes, single single family homes. And I really wasn't seeing a lot because a lot of the things in my price range are either fixer uppers or really, really small. And obviously I can do one of those things. I can't do the other. Um I I can't do small. I'm too big a person. I'm six feet tall, okay? And basically so I was looking at, you know, whatever the places that I could, you know, look at and, you know, wasn't finding a lot. So I had to, you know, kind of broaden my horizon, you know, look at, you know, widen my scope that I was looking for, kind of change my recommendation, you know, what, what I was looking for a little bit to, to kind of open it up a little bit. And that's what you got to do. You got to be flexible with it. And ultimately it was kind of by luck that we found a place that was fairly close to where I was living already and it was within my price range. It was two car garage, three bedroom, three bath, uh, 1300 square feet and, um, fairly good condition. I mean, obviously, you know, when you move in, you find all the little things here and there, but, um, yeah, pretty good condition. So this was the third place that I put an offer on. The first two places I put offer on didn't accept it. One of them would have been a dream home, but it didn't happen. And that, and that will happen. So lesson number three is be prepared for rejection. You will get rejected. And so when I got the offer, when I got it accepted, um, now comes the fun part. And this is the part that people don't know about home buying. If you're a first-time home buyer, this is for you. If you're not a first-time home buyer, you're going to be like, oh yeah, I know all about that. Because it's stuff you don't think about. There's... I mean, you, you think it's just, okay, I put the offer on, then we just kind of negotiate the terms and then sign the contract and we're good. Uh-uh. No, 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 no. There's a lot to it. Because <laughs> um, basically, once you put that offer, and even when you put the offer on, you have to do what's called earnest money. 
Earnest money is basically you write out a check for like $2,000 or $3,000. You put this check down and you basically say, okay, I have this money that if I had to cash this, if someone had to cash this check today, I would have that money. That's called earnest money. That means A, that you're serious about buying and B, that you're capable of doing it. Now, the way that I went, I did an FHA loan and I'm not going to get into all the different kinds of loans because that in itself is a quagmire, but you know, an FHA loan, basically I was going to be doing something that was, you know, a low down payment, but fixed interest rate for 30 years, basically. So I've pretty much put myself in debt for 30 years. Pretty awesome when I think about it, because at least I got a home out of it. But still, I'm in debt for 30 years. On top of my student loan debt that I'm still in debt for, for another 30 years, 20 years, I don't know. Either way, I got plenty of debt. But that's part of being an adult. Eventually, we have to adult somehow. So basically, once you make the offer, and if they accept the offer, you know, you've got your earnest money. Now, that earnest money check is not going to be cashed right away. In fact, what's going to happen is you take it to the title company. The title company is, you know, whoever basically handles the title, the deed to the house. And the title company is chosen by the seller. And so the seller picks, you know, one of these, you know, different financial, you know, um, title companies and you give them this check and basically they can, they're going to hold on to that check until this whole process is done. So now you've given them the earnest money, you have your offer, now it's time for the fun stuff. What happens is then you're going to have an inspection um, and there's a number of different things you can do the inspection but basically you're going to have a licensed inspector come in and they're going to go through the house, they're going to look at everything, and they're going to say, okay, this is what needs to be, or this is what they recommend to be fixed. Or if they find something that's major, they're going to say, you know, you you really should not buy this house in this condition. Um, especially if you're doing an FHA loan, there's things that are required for the seller to fix beforehand. So there's kind of that advantage there. Um, but um, at the same time, no matter what, you want to go through that house, you want to see everything that could potentially be wrong, because if you buy this place and it looks perfect, that there might be something wrong with it that you're not seeing, and an inspector is going to see it. I actually found, there was a place that I really liked, um, decent, like, two-story um, townhome, and it looked awesome. They had done a lot of work to really, you know, bring this place up to speed, but there was a letter in the kitchen that said they had to disclose a foundation issue that they had. And so he went down into the basis, basement, and sure enough, there were foundation issues. This whole wall was cracked. It was just like, and they had like sealed it with just, I, I don't even want to, it looked like Frankenstein's wall. It was ridiculous. Um, <laughs> and it's like, I'm not sure we should even dare with this one because with that kind of severe structural damage, you know, it could, it could have, they could have fixed it or it could only be a matter of time before that thing just, so you got to do the home inspection. So no matter what, and every broker, anybody's going to say, you have to do this home inspection. It's going to be part of the contract and the home inspection, you know, they go through it and when they get through it, they have a list of all the things that they find and you know their recommendations so the home inspector they don't actually like do anything other than investigate all the parts of the house once the home inspection is done then you do what's called inspection objections and this is where you start to get into the negotiations of um you know what to do with the house so the inspection objections you send this to the the seller and the seller will say, okay, or you say, these are the things that we need done before we can take ownership of the house. And the seller is going to take that list and say, okay, we'll do this, we'll do this, we won't do this. And then, so there's kind of this negotiation that goes on. And once that happens, then basically it's, from there, it's the process of the seller getting things ready for the final closing. And then on the buyer's end is to get all the financial stuff dealing with. So when you make an offer on a house, one thing that you're going to want to have already in the bank is a bank. You're going to want to have somebody who's lending you the money because unless you're paying in cash, which could happen, but unless you are paying in cash, you are going to need to get a loan from somebody. So you go and you apply for this loan. And when you apply for the loan, that's when you start having to you know, give them everything. You give them you know, your tax records. You give them your bank account. You give them your bank statement. You give them your social security 
you give them, you know, if there's any like legal stuff, name changes, stuff like that, you give them all of this information and then they put together this, well, this is what kind of loan, this is what loan they can give you. They can reasonably give you this amount of money within like, you know, how much you make and, you know, they take into account all of your other debt and they say, this is what the loan that we can offer you. And then once they, once you made the offer and once they tell you basically this is how much they can give you, then they do what is basically an estimate of this is what you're going to be paying. And that number, you don't want to marry yourself to because that number is going to change. <laughs> Um, especially if it's a you know moving target interest rate, and you know because the first number they gave me the good faith estimate that's what it's called good faith estimate. <laughs> the first one they gave me, I was like, all right, that's that's a good one. It changed. It did not stay the same. Um, so, but that's that's part of what it is. I mean, it's it, they'll give you a good faith estimate, and it it could very well change because if there's a if there's a period of time between when you you know apply for this loan and when you're closing and in that period of time it's not like the financial markets just stay the way they are it's not just like you know taxes and all this other stuff stays the way it is it's always in flux so the numbers that they have they're going to give you initial estimate but then after that it's going to kind of fluctuate but if they're doing their job right they're going to nail it down and give you a good faith estimate or give you the final numbers before you close. Now, when you're ready, once everything is done, you do a final inspection, you walk through, you make sure that they did whatever they said they did in the inspection objections. Because during this entire process, if they don't, you can walk away. And that that $2,000 check that you handed over to the title company, you can get that back. But at the same time, that means you have to start the process over. So not always ideal. But then you go to closing, and closing, and this is after you've already, you know, signed all sorts of documents between the loan documents, um, any broker documents, the contract, any of the other. Um, there's a lot of different disclosures and things like that that come up in the process. So after signing hundreds of documents, you get to sign hundreds of documents. Um, it's it's an insane amount of paperwork that goes into into this that by the end of it, yes, you get your keys, but whew, man, your wrist really hurts after the end of that closing. But after jumping through all these hoops, which could be, you know, it's a process that could take, you know, a matter of weeks, it could take a couple months, it depends on how, you know, quickly the buyer needs, or the how quickly the buyer needs the place, or how quickly the seller wants to unload it, it's, you know, there's a number of factors in there. Um, but yeah, in, in the end, you go through a lot in order to get a house. But at the end of it, there's something very different when you walk into your own home. Like, it, it's, it's a different feeling. You know, when I walk into an apartment that I rent, it's a nice place. It feels like home. I lived in the last place for five years. It felt like home. But it's a different feeling when you walk in and it's a place that you own because you can change things, you can do whatever you want, you can make it your own. And that's one of the more amazing feelings. So, um, I don't really have time to go on a full tour, but I will give you this awesome little tour of my office, because that's what this place is. I'll fix the lighting and all that, but I got my wall of Tarantino over there. Got my television there with a bunch of classic video game consoles. Oh yeah, I went there part of my mammoth mammoth DVD collection is up here. I got the other stuff downstairs. This is all the B team, but <laughs> yeah. But it's awesome to make a place your own. To call it home. So, it's it's a different feeling and it's very exciting. Doesn't mean it's not stressful as hell, but it's exciting. And I can't wait to see what I do with this place. It's 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 going to be a lot of fun. So, I'm not saying don't try to buy a home. I'm just saying don't try to buy a home in Denver right now because it's insane. And that's all for today. So thanks for watching. Um, you can check out more Paved with Good Intentions right here on YouTube or you can subscribe on iTunes and Stitcher. You can see any of the other videos I've made and anything I've favorited. I'm doing a lot of videos right now, mostly movie related, but you can check them out. And um, you can see all the other videos that I've 
watched on YouTube. If you like Amorphous, you'll find a lot of that. Uh, be sure to check out my other podcast, Translation, which you can find at the link below, as well as on iTunes and Stitcher. And visit me on Twitter at Danny Kessner, or you can find me on Facebook. If you have any questions you'd like me to ponder on the show, send me an email at translationpodcast at gmail.com. I do want to hear from you, so please keep in touch. And once again, this podcast is produced sponsor-free, so thank you for supporting independent artists. See you on the other side.